With the weather here in eastern Ontario just not cooperating, what I had planned for this episode of STV is not going to happen. I mean, the snow is melting faster than a snowball on HE double hockey sticks, and the trails that were starting to open up in the area have literally been flushed down the toilet. So today, we're going to get out of the rain and into the shop to work on some of the old iron, getting it ready for when winter does finally decide to come back. Nature, ah, she can be a real mother. STV is brought to you by Yamaha, revs your heart. Ultimax belts, performance driven, performance proven. And by Polaris, think outside. Leading into the Christmas season, the conditions around here were actually getting half decent and that gave me the chance to get out on these old sleds and kind of shake them down to figure out everything that was wrong. So on this show, we're going to fix all that stuff so that they're good to go when the snow does finally come back. With the little hit of snow we had, it did give me the chance to get out and shake the rockets down and I found a bunch of little problems. Some I've already sorted out and others I haven't, so hopefully by the end of this show, I've got everything in tip-top shape once again. Well, maybe not tip-top shape. These sleds will never be in tip-top shape again. I'm not looking for good, just good enough for now. So let's start with the SCSI, the sled that never fails to fail. At the end of last season, the SCSI wasn't running too well or, well, actually at all. So I decided to park it at the end of February and the next thing I knew, the season was over. So I did exactly what you're not supposed to do. I left it exactly where it died in the backyard, and the storage procedure was to throw a tarp on it. But really, I did that to show on STV here what can happen when you neglect a sled over the summer and everything that can go wrong. So really, you guys made me do it. I got lucky though, no critters got in there, no bearings seized up, and because it wasn't running, I didn't even fog the engine or put fuel stabilizer in the gas. When I say I left it where it died, I left it where it died. You should never do this. I got incredibly lucky that more damage didn't happen. So don't do this. Please store your sled properly. It will thank you in the fall. Now, obviously I did get it in the shop and I did get it running after I found out why it died last season. Because apparently a fella didn't install the lock washer behind this nut that holds the stator onto the end of the crankshaft. Anyways, when the nut went away, the stator flywheel came loose, which caused the major misfire that the SCSI had, but it also caused a recoil problem because as this thing was banging around in there, well, it chewed up the recoil mechanism pretty bad. And that meant the recoil rope wouldn't go back inside anymore, which is why I never got started again. Now, I normally would want to have a chat with the fellow who worked on the SCSI, but because that fellow was me, I got to do my own warranty work. So I went to my spare engine, grabbed the nut, grabbed the lock washer, the keyway key, and the stator flywheel out of that motor to put in the SCSI. Now, I didn't have any recoil, so I did the right thing and installed the broken one back in. It kind of works, sort of, sometimes, but I do find with a generous squirt of brake clean down each carburetor, the SCSI fires up just fine with 1.5 turns that I can get out of the recoil right now. Remember, I'm not going for good, just good enough. With the sled running and after a quick burn in the backyard when there was still snow, it still wouldn't really rev up at all. So I changed the stator out once again, which apparently is a thing on these old 800s. Now I did put the lock washer back in and it was better, but still not perfect. So this is the stator out of the SCSI. And the reason why I changed it because some of the ohm readings I was getting when I was testing it were a little bit out of whack. But this is typically what they look like, except normally there would be a second connector here. I had to rob this one because somebody had already robbed the connector off the one that I put back in the SCSI. Now, the stator is basically the alternator of your snowmobile. This thing is what generates the electricity for your electrical system and the ignition system, but they can burn out over time and cause all kinds of problems. You can go online for the proper testing procedures, which you can do right in the sled. On the mag side of the engine, you'll find some wires coming out of the case with connectors. Pop those connectors open so you can test things out. You'll need a voltmeter that allows you to test for continuity and ohms. 
Then, with the tester set to continuity, you're looking for a break in the windings or a dead short in the ground. Either of these issues is a fail. Now, if that checks out good, your next step is to check for resistance by probing out each wire. My next step was to take the carbs apart where I found some clogged pilot jets. I'm sure thanks to my lack of storage procedures. Now, things improved a little bit, but the SCUS still wasn't running great. On old blisters like this, you might get into this situation where you have multiple problems all stacked up one after another. These old sleds are great, but man, they can be frustrating. But a fella's put himself in this position, so a fella's just gotta say to himself, just one step at a time, one step at a time. I think at this point, I've got my ignition sorted out and the carbs are sorted out, and I did get a chance to go out for a test ride before the snow disappeared outside and still not quite fixed. What it's doing now is it's idling great, comes out of the hole great, revs up to like 8,300 RPM and goes good. But then right after that, it starts to fall and fall back to about 6,000 RPM and bog like crazy. <sighs> so I think my next problem is in the clutches. And surprise, surprise, I found an issue. The helix on the secondary was all galled up and I think it was sticking the clutches essentially in high gear and it wouldn't allow a back shift and it wouldn't allow the engine to rev up again. Now the proper fix for this would be a new helix, buttons, and maybe a spring too. I don't have any of those, so I'm gonna do the next best thing and clean them up as best I can with a bit of sandpaper and Scotch-Brite and put all that junk back in there because nothing is too good for the SCSI. Now I will order some new parts. Hopefully they arrive before the snow comes back. So right now I think I've got all the mechanical work done on the SCSI, well until the next road test out there, but because there's no snow, I can't do that. So I'm going to do the next best thing and throw more lipstick on this pig by installing a set of new Kimpex aftermarket skis because these ones are pretty worn out. Now I should have done this last year, but the SCSI wasn't running, so I'm going to do it now. These units are a universal fit design that with the correct mounting bracket can bolt up to just about any spindle out there. Now these things have a keel design that balances steering effort to grip and can be ordered with a couple of choices when it comes to the aggressiveness of the runners. These are a good economical replacement option for a trail ski. With a plastic ski, it's not if they wear out, it's when. It's just gonna happen over time. Now snow can be pretty abrasive, especially dirty snow, and it's gonna wear on the plastic. Now the more you ride in fresh conditions, the longer the ski will last, but eventually the plastic is gonna disappear. On the SCUS, the keel here is getting really worn around the runner, and because this is an excellent example of a finely tuned performance machine, I mean, just look at the stickers, I felt this was a problem that needed to be fixed. Installing any new ski is pretty simple. The instructions will walk you through the proper assembly of the mounting kit specific to your brand of sled, and then from that point, it's a single bolt fixing them to the spindles. The ski rubber can make this a little tough to get the bolt through, so use the weight of the sled as much as you can to help out, and maybe a BFH for that little bit of extra persuasion. Now, one thing to remember anytime you're playing with your skis and changing them out is to make sure you've got a good nylock nut on there, one that's going to grip the bolt really well, or if you've got the style with the cotter pin, put a new cotter pin in there, because the last thing you want is that bolt to come out and the ski to leave the chat, because that is going to end badly. Speaking of ending badly, the next thing to happen on the SCUS is to take it out and see if we've actually fixed any problems or, well, there's probably going to be more. So we'll find that out once the snow conditions are back. Coming up next after the break, we're going to throw some wrenches at Goldmember. This segment is brought to you by Polaris. With old sleds, there's definitely a ratio between wrench time and ride time to be found. And with my group of old crap cans, definitely spending more time wrenching than I am riding, especially with the SCSI here. But so far, thankfully, Goldmember has not been following that trend. And I think once I get all the gremlins worked out of this thing, it's gonna be pretty good. Mainly because this sled does not have enough power to consume itself. When I first acquired the sled, all it took to get running was just a good carb cleaning and a fuel gauge repair to stop the gas from leaking out of the tank, and I was ripping up the back 40. I must admit, it's a pretty fun sled to ride and surprisingly comfortable, almost as if that was the goal when Yamaha built it. I did notice one problem though. The brakes on Goldmember are about as soft as Kenny G. Now, I didn't think that was a problem with a sled with only 28 horsepower. I thought they were good enough. 
And that was until the young lad Brody got a hold of the machine and was riding around outside. Now, I was in here working on the scuzz over there, and next thing you knew, I heard the sled go wide open, and the sled <laughs> bang into the garage door. I look over, and I got two ski tips poking through the garage door here. Apparently, he was trying to Fred Flintstone the thing into stopping, but he grabbed a hold of the Finger Blaster 3000 on the handlebars and went wide open right into the door. <sighs> Anyways, can't be upset. I knew it didn't have any brakes. You would think he would have figured out there was no brakes after riding it for about four minutes, but no, no, he didn't. And now I'm in the market for a garage door if anybody wants to sponsor me. And with that little incident behind us, I thought maybe putting working brakes on the sled would be a good idea. So I picked up a set of the oddest looking brake pad shoe thingies I've ever seen. Now with its lack of performance in mind, Yamaha installed a cable actuated brake system that was not just good, but apparently good enough for the inviter. This type of brake is often found on older sleds and I suppose adequate for most levels of performance back then. But you'll never be able to generate as much power with this cable system as you will with a modern hydraulic one. And I know back in the day there was plenty of fast sleds that used cables to operate the brakes. I bet you those things were pretty hairy to get stopped. Now that could be one of the reasons why a lot of those unrestored old sleds have bumpers that are all caved in and hoods that are bashed up because if the brakes won't stop you, the tree will, or maybe the garage door. Changing the brakes out on gold members seem pretty straightforward. Now I don't have a service manual for the inviter and as a bit of an oddball, after an exhaustive 35 second search, I couldn't find anything online either. So I'm just going to dive right in. Both shoe pad thingies are mounted on a pin with springs to pull them back, which seems pretty simple. Now, they still had some brake material left on them. I think the brakes were mostly out of adjustment, but with these new binders, this sled is gonna be good for another 40 years or so. Now, the brakes were about the biggest issue that I had with Gold Member here, but seeing as how this is a luxury cruising machine, it is equipped with electric start, the only sled in my fleet to have that option, but the battery is deader than disco. Changing the battery is pretty easy too, but there's one thing to remember, and that's when both terminals are connected, one wrong move with the wrench or screwdriver, and you could be doing some unexpected arc welding. So whenever you're removing or installing a battery, make sure you start the job and finish the job with the negative cable. That way, when you're undoing the negative cable and maybe you happen to touch a wrench between the negative side and something metal in the chassis, it's already on the ground, it's not gonna do any damage. Then when that cable is off, move to the positive side, and in that case, if you do happen to touch your wrench from the positive side as you're trying to undo that cable to something metal around the battery, it's not going to arc out because there's no path back to ground. And do the same thing when you're putting it back together. Start with the positive and end with the negative. Of course, at no time, never drop your wrench between the positive and negative terminals because that will create an electrifying situation you don't want. Now all that's left for gold member here is to make sure that the battery is held down tight in the sled and try it out for real this time. That's fixed. Bring the thunder. Nope. Now it seems like the inviter is gonna fit right into my fleet of crap cans. The starter is fried and I'll have to find another one, which I'm sure is made from unobtainium for an oddball sled like this one. Well, sometimes with this old stuff, things don't go always quite according to plan. I think Gold Member is now requesting a brand new starter because that one, I, I think, is done. So we've hit a wall with these sleds for the time being. So next, coming up after the break, we're going to look at some of the tools that I use here in the shop. All right, one more time. Though. Here we go. For all the marbles. Come on. Oh, it wants to go. It wants to go. Why don't you go? You get a bigger hammer. Do that. One more time. just not gonna happen. This segment is brought to you by Yamaha. So I'm gonna start this segment by saying I'm not actually a professional snowmobile mechanic. I just play one on TV, but I do like spinning wrenches and I do like building things, whether it's for snowmobiles or race cars. And over the years, I've managed to gather up some tools specifically for snowmobiles that I'm gonna talk about here that really help me do what I do here in the shop. Now the first one I want to talk about is a snowmobile lift. Any kind of a snowmobile lift. If you're working on snowmobiles in a shop, buy yourself a snowmobile lift. You will not regret spending that kind of money. Working on a sled at this level is so much better than working on one down on the ground. 
getting a lift is key if you want to work on snowmobiles in the shop. Plus, this one's on wheels, so you can move it around once it's up on the lift, so you can bring it around your shop to wherever you're going to be doing that work. Now, this one does have a winch style system to be able to mechanically lever that sled up off the ground. It's an older unit. This one's got a brake, thankfully, for when you're letting the sled back down. Not all of them have that brake, or if that brake was to fail, that handle that you used to crank, well, it's going to wing away from you, and it's going to hit the back of your hand probably four or five times if you were to let it go before your brain figures out that your hand is actually getting hit. Make sure you get one with the mechanical mechanism for lifting these things up and down. It is definitely the better way to go. Now, the second tool I want to talk about is one that I thought originally was going to be a bit of a gimmick, but it's turned out to be something that I use quite often here in the shop, and it's from Bite Harder, and it's the side support stand. Now, this thing, again, I thought it was going to be a gimmick, but it actually works awesome. What it does with the hook here, you can connect that into the snowmobile steering post or handlebar riser, and then when you lift the sled up on its side, it doesn't let the sled roll right over on top. So it's not gonna crush your windshield or it's not gonna crush your mirrors and it's not gonna scuff up the side of your sled if you care. Don't really care about SCSI here, but if you do care, this is gonna keep it off the ground. It's actually really good. The next thing I wanna talk about is a spring puller. Now, this one I've made out of an old screwdriver and it's essentially free. Uh, carve the end up with a grinder to make a little hook in there to get those exhaust springs on and off. But if you've ever worked on a sled like the SCSI here, you know there's about 14,000 exhaust springs on there holding it together. So I went out and I got a proper spring tool. This one is from Woody's and this is a lifesaver. If you're gonna be working on exhaust springs at all, even if you don't have as many as the SCSI here, this is an absolute must to have in your shop toolbox. It's got a number of different little hooks on the end to be able to pull on a spring or push it to get it back into place. And when you're working on snowmobiles, exhaust springs, you know how much of a pain they can be. This is a real lifesaver. And for 30 bucks, definitely put this in your toolbox. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is something that may not be for everyone, but is a tool that I find super handy here in the shop, and it's the Blue Giant an industrial pallet lifter that you'd find in a warehouse, or maybe you've seen something like this at Home Depot. This one isn't motorized, you have to push it around by hand, but it is absolutely critical for what I do here in the shop. Obviously, I can lift snowmobiles on it and work on them. Now, if you are lifting snowmobiles, you do need fork extensions to be able to get the forks out far enough to pick up the sled, otherwise they fall off the front. But with the fork extensions, you can lift them up and down. There's a 12 volt hydraulic pump in there. And I think this thing will lift like 12 feet high. It's also what I use to get the sleds up and down from the mezzanine. And this will work on ATVs and side-by-sides because it will lift like 1,500 pounds. The only drawback to this is that you do need a very hard flat floor, a concrete floor essentially. It is though kind of big, takes up a lot of room. And because this one isn't motorized, you're pushing it around by hand and you definitely don't want to let this thing get out of hand because there's a lot of weight on there to crash into other things that you might have in the shop. So there it is. There's four tools that really do help me pretend to be a mechanic and hopefully they help you with your mechanics. This segment is brought to you by CKX. Getting the sled back down to earth is always the sketchy part, but now that it's on the ground, I do have a reasonable amount of confidence that this thing is gonna fire to life. It's definitely dirty from sitting in the shop all summer, but I believe I cared when I put it away, so I think the engine's been fogged and there should be fuel stabilizer in there. So again, I think it's gonna to come to life, but I'm gonna try a trick to try to avoid having to pull this thing over 17,000 times to get it to fire. Hopefully this works. I'm gonna do the wrong thing here and gently pressurize the fuel tank with air to push fuel and fill up the float bowls and the carbs. Now to know they're getting some dinosaur juice, I'm gonna watch bubbles moving through the fuel lines. This air pressure trick works, but you do have to be real careful. For one thing, you don't wanna to put too much pressure into the tank. This can crack or blow a seam spraying fuel everywhere. Plus, 
if you don't see any fuel moving through the lines, don't just add more pressure. There could be a blocked fuel pump or fuel pickup or filter. And then if you do see that fuel flowing, there is a real danger that there's a stuck float, which means you could be overfilling the carbs and that fuel has to go somewhere. And that could be into the bottom of the engine. So this is the part that I'm getting way too old for. I think I've made the decision I'm not gonna buy another old sled that doesn't have electric start, even if I gotta spend some time to get it to work like I did the uh, gold member over there. So now I've got the carbs full of fuel. I'm gonna turn the ignition on, turn choke to full, and if everything goes the way I have it up here in my head, four or five pulls and this thing should be running. Any bets? Don't want to run it long though, because this thing's going to smoke out the shop in minutes. That's good. I am happy. And I didn't have to use the brake clean. The engine's going to be happier about that fact too. Perfect. Oh, it smells good as well. I just love the sound of triple pipes with stingers on them, don't you? And four pulls. This thing's never started with four pulls before. It's going to be a good season with the Indy. Now you might be wondering, where is the old Yamaha SRX? And I'll have you know, it's at home right now but it was running like an absolute top before we lost all the snow. So it's ready to go. The Indy's gonna be ready to go. And if I go online and order parts, a new starter for the gold member and a new Helix for the SCSI, I'm gonna have my whole fleet of crap cans ready to go for when the snow comes back, hopefully on a future episode of Snowmobiler Television. I'm gonna fire it up again, cause I just like the sound of this. Closed captioning is brought to you by Ultimax. STV has been brought to you by CKX, where your passion. Best Western hotels and resorts, ready to get away. And by On Snow Magazine, for snowmobilers, from snowmobilers.